I'll start. My name is Rod, and I like to party. Do you mean whiskey? What? You're saying it weird. Saying what weird? All of it. Where do you get off? All right, welcome to the Church Blender Podcast, friends. This is a special day for us. Uh, if you're new around here, my name is Robert Frazier, and uh, I'm a part of the team that puts on the Church Planner Podcast, and I also lead a church planning network in Boise, Idaho, called the City Network. And I'm here today with uh, a new friend who's an old digital friend. It's always it's always a funny like we well we met online here, but then we actually like hung out here. So what date do we do we call our first time together? You know, I, I don't know. But today, but today we have Michael Frost with us. The um, oh, I wanted I wanted to use a superlative that was a little bit over the top, but the the most excellent Michael Frost, uh, who has who has influenced a lot of us um, in in some incredible ways. So thank you for joining us today. Hey Bobby, thanks. It's great to talk with you. And it is a funny thing, isn't it? When you feel like quite a connection to people, you see them online, you interact with them regularly, you know, and and then you meet. It's like, is this actually the first time we're ever meeting? And even now we're meeting like on a screen. But you know, I've met people physically face to face for the first time and thought, I surely I, I've met you before. I feel like I know so much about you. So yeah, it's the new world we live in, man. It totally is. And do you like? Do you like Mike? Do you like Michael? Do you like, I hear people call you Frosty. Yeah, yeah, yeah like people call me Frosty. I mean, I teach at a, at a university and students call me Frosty behind my back. So I'll sometimes hear them say, oh, you know, have you got Frosty this hour? But when I appear, they all like apologize. Sorry, 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 Dr. Frost. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> uh, my mate Alan Hirsch calls me Frosty and, and he calls me that to other people. So I think lots of people think, oh, that's what he... He gets called Mike or Frost. You can call me Frosty if you like, Bobby. Since we're 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 converting Robert to to Bobby, why not? Yeah. Well, well, from what I, from my dear friends who are Australian, they they may be the most nicknamed people on earth right. as Australians. They they love creating shortened and and funny names. So we'll we'll call you Frosty today, and then we'll <laughs> see how it feels, and then we'll go from there. Sound good? <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm I'm in my truck today, but uh, Frosty is in his office at Moreland College there in outside. No, Southern no. Park. In fact, this is my home. Uh, oh, this right. is your home. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, today I wanted to have you on mostly because I'm a fanboy and wanted to hang out. But there's another purpose, which is I I'd love to share what you have done in your new book, Mission Is the Shape of Water, um, because I think it it's it's a really important shift that most church planters have to make because most church planters have an imaginary church plant in their head that they're trying to make happen in the world no matter what is happening in the world around them yeah. so they're they're trying to take a round peg and put it in every square hole they can find till it till it fits and so yeah. I, I love the book what what is it what conversations kind of spurred the book on that got you thinking about this is a, a conversation we need to have yeah, well, I mean, like, I guess two two streams of conversation. One is what you just alluded to there, which is the whole importance of context for church leadership and for church planting. And uh, I think things are slowly shifting, but certainly there was a point there where kind of church planting generally was still um, following the kind of uh, franchising kind of line that, you know, we, we have a kind of a, a prefabbed, predetermined idea of what church is and maybe it comes from the the mother church or the planting church um and we're we're just going to put it in this neighborhood or this town or this village come hell or high water they're going to get it and um but I, as i said i think that's shifting i think people now after lots of conversation around this and networks like yours and others talking about this there is an awareness like hold on wait a second prefabbed church turn up, plonk it in any context and expect people will come to it is just not working and it's kind of burning us out anyway. So there has been an awareness of what it means to be an incarnational movement within a particular uh, cultural context and to take culture seriously in terms of giving us cues and clues as to what kind of church or a faith community might look like. 
in a particular context. But we still have some ways to, to go on that. We still, as you say, we still are somewhat kind of victimised by our limited imaginations, no disrespect to anyone, but we were shaped by a certain view of church and a certain way that church was done. And it obviously worked for us because, you know, we grew up in the church and we're committed to church and we want to go plant churches. So it's shaped our imaginations significantly because for us it was a successful way of doing and thinking about church. But it's often difficult then for us to kind of shed that and to go into a particular context, recognising that it might well be that what God wants to plant in that place is something entirely different to what we like or prefer or that we grew up with or what shapes our imagination. So the one stream of conversation was about context. But the other stream might sound a bit odd, but I, I teach missiology at a university and I teach a unit, a subject called the history of Christian mission. And I... What I've discovered in teaching that was that, you know, this has always been the case. This is not a early 21st century challenge uh, to, to reconsider context and culture, that throughout history, the church has been shaped and the, the missional frame of church has been shaped by different things in different epochs and in different parts of the world. And so, yeah, I came up with, I guess, in terms of thinking of culture and context and the history of the church, uh, I came up with this idea that, like, mission is like water. Water is always H2O. Its essential properties don't change. So the mission of God's people remains the same. It's a kind of steady state or fixed state of what that is. But that like water, it's shaped by whatever container it finds itself in. So it can be shaped like a, a bottle or it can be shaped like a lake. Um, and we have to take context and culture seriously enough to allow mission to seep into and to be shaped by the cultural container. And so I found that actually exploring the history of the church is quite freeing. It frees our imaginations because often people only have the last, you know, 30, 50 years to go on. That's all they've got. Their parents kind of church and church understanding and then theirs and their generation. And it's hard for people to kind of go back and think, has it has it always been like this, like the last 50, 60 years or so? And the answer is no, it has not always been like this. In fact, it's been quite radically different to this at different parts uh, of, the, of the Christian story. So they were the kind of motivations, like to free our imaginations to explore what church could look like. Well, what I'm struck by as you're talking about it is the the reason why we have these cookie cutter models of the way we think about church is that we have we've been so shaped. Man, I got to turn off notifications. They're just they're <laughs> going at me here. Focus, do not disturb. There we go. Um, but uh, our cultural expectations are so are so built by the the experience that we have in the world. And if you talk about any organization on earth, what they're always trying to do is get more efficient and try to create efficiencies of scale that come by reproducing the same work over and over and over again so that it's cheaper to go further and faster. And right. it's the, it's a very Western and it's a very American and I mean, English, like the Industrial Revolution took this idea of if we do things a thousand times, it should get cheaper so we can make more of them and make more money. And, right. you know, all, the, all this greed stuff that's a part of it. And it, it, it feels like what you're saying. And I think that this is tied to a shift in culture is that we don't have a homogenous culture anymore that like the Western culture is splintered in thousands and millions of different ways around music and food and experience and at the same time there's still this cultural barrage of of messages that are corporately formed and trying to break in and the church is still trying to use these corporate forms of messaging and brand and you know 50 years ago you put up first presbyterian church because then people would know what they were getting when they showed up at the church it was a brand awareness and what, what's happened is everybody wants something that's more bespoke, something that is built for them in that space, in that time. And they want something that is like integrated, natural, what, you know, uh, Alan calls organic systems like that, like it, it, it's born out of its shape. So do you think that, do you think that the cultural ground itself has shifted or do you think that everybody, like people have needed this for a long time and we've missed it? 
Uh, well, that's a good question. I think um, I agree with everything you just said then about kind of shifts in, in Western culture. It's the same in my context as you just, just described. So, And all of that plays really nicely into the idea of incarnational church, doesn't it? I mean, if you've got a community that actually wants kind of local businesses, bespoke kind of uh, um, uh, goods and services, they want something that kind of belongs here and is shaped by the values of this place here, that's just perfect. Like, why wouldn't church want to say, well, yeah, we we, we will be that too, absolutely. But um, uh, to your question about whether that has always been the case, yes and no. I mean, I think that I, in the book there's lots of stories of people committed to Christian mission who have gone to various places with an idea of what mission should look like and the context kind of threw up challenges and needs and concerns in such a way as completely diverted their efforts in good ways. Like they they abandoned their, their previous vision and moved uh, into the needs of the particular day. So I tell the story of a woman who went as a missionary to the Congo in uh, in the very late or turn of the, the 20th century, the late 1890s into the early 1900s. She went to be a conventional uh, conversionist preaching, Bible teaching kind of missionary, you know, with the white dress and the whole thing from the from the 1800s. And when she gets there, she realizes she's walked into one of the greatest atrocities of the early 20th century, which was the Belgian Congo. The the Belgians and turned the Congo Delta into a gigantic concentration camp. There was rape, murder, uh, mutilation. I mean, it was unspeakable, unspeakable horror. It's amazing we don't talk much about it these days, but she ends up completely shifting from being a kind of a, a Bible teaching kind of conversionist missionary into an advocate. She starts photographing the mutilated uh, Congolese and then goes back to the, the United Kingdom and then eventually to the United States and does lectures and does slideshows of her of her dreadful images and put shames the, the Belgian government so much, they abandon the Congo and dismantle the whole of their, their system. I mean, it's a, a, she's considered in the human rights world as one of the most famous pioneer human rights advocates, often not spoken of as a missionary, but she went as a Baptist missionary the hmm. context threw up such a dreadful challenge to her. She doesn't stick with what she goes there to do. She responds to the needs of that culture. So that, that but that's from the very early 1900s. I have a friend of mine who is a um, an Australian guy raised uh, by Italian parents on a, a market garden. His parents kind of grew fruit and vegetables. He went to university, studied agriculture felt called to the mission field, went to Bible college, ended up going to the Niger Delta in West Africa to be, again, a preaching, Bible teaching missionary. When he got there, he discovered that the Niger Delta has almost been completely denuded of all trees. Like they just chopped out every tree in order to like to to, to uh, cook their food and what have you. I mean, it's just completely devastated. Mm. So all that does is degrade the earth and the earth becomes degraded, and there's no shade. So they're planting crops, and their crops are continually failing. Uh, people have descended into abject poverty. He gets there and realizes that they're trying to plant trees by buying little seedlings, like tiny trees, and planting them. And they die too, because the soil is so bad, and there's no, no, no shade for them. And so he discovers, as an agriculturalist, he realizes that under the ground there is a whole root system of th this jungle that had now been cut down. So they cut down the trees, but the roots are all still under the ground. And so he says, do you know that you've actually got a forest underground? So he teaches them how to dig into the soil and how, I can't explain this like properly with agricultural terms, but how to... to um, to cut into the root to spark uh, uh, shoots. And yeah. he's literally re-greened. I can't remember to tell you how many acres of land. I mean, he's, he's created forests all across the Niger Delta by teaching farmers how to do this and has mm. lifted, again, hundreds of thousands of people out of poverty. Now, there's two mm. examples of missionaries who have gone to contexts, one in the Congo, one in the Niger, with a particular view in mind as to what mission will look like, shaped by their previous training, I guess, and 
what they encounter is either human rights atrocities or in the other case, abject poverty, and have discovered they actually have skills and technique and talent of a camera in Alice Seeley Harris's um, case and agricultural training in Tony Ronaldo's case. And mission becomes kind of bringing the kingdom into this place, which is freedom from, from a, oppression in the Congo and freedom from poverty. And of course, also the, the, the regeneration of the, of the land in the Niger Valley. So the, to me, the point, the question here is like, not what does a church look like in this place? That tends to be our first question. But what does the reign of God look like in this place? If, if our task is to alert people to the unfolding reign of God in this world, we need to ask ourselves, well, what would it look like if the reign of God was perceived or seen unfolding in this particular place, suburb, town, village, country, African Delta? And of course, in in uh, in the Niger, it looks like a forest. I mean, the reign of God looks like the regeneration of the planet and the the flourishing of human society there. In the Congo, it looks like the end of atrocities and oppression and, and cruelty and violence. I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? The more difficult questions are, what does it look like in my suburb in Boise, Idaho? Like, what does the reign of God look like in this particular place? And I think, Bobby, one of the bigger questions that we struggle to answer is not just around what should church look like. We really struggle to figure out what does the reign of God look like? And I've encountered this over and over and over with church planters, but also uh, with uh, theological students and with pastors. When you ask them to describe the kingdom of God, like your task is to alert me to the reign of God. So what does it look like? People actually struggle. I mean, they kind of get there, but it doesn't flow out of them. Whereas if I was to ask them, can you tell me what is the gospel Oh, they all tell me that Jesus died for my sins on the cross. So what we've done is we've taken part of the reign of God, this idea that Jesus can set us free from fear and sin and death and the devil, the kind of atonement of, of Christ. That is part of the reign of God, and but that's all we concentrate on. If we, It's just a slice of this the extraordinary beginning story. of the reign of God, not well, not sure. The, and in that case, yeah. the beginning of the new yeah, covenant. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. yeah, what does I mean? What did Isaiah anticipate? Oh, Isaiah, as Americans say. What no, would, say what, your way. Your way's better. <laughs> what does Isaiah? After I might get this right every time. What does Isaiah anticipate the year of the Lord's favor to be like? He's always talking about yeah. this day is coming, a new world is coming. Like yeah. I know you're in Babylon. I know it's difficult. We're refugees. We're victims of war. I mean, it's just terrible. We're living in hell. It's horrific. But a day is coming. Don't wait. It's going. Someone will come. The suffering servant is coming. A new world is coming. A new city is coming. I mean, all of these prophecies are all fulfilled in Christ. Uh -huh. who then dispenses the Holy Spirit to his followers and says, go now build this city in, in uh, uh, to the other ends of the earth. So what is Isaiah telling us the reign of God looks like? What does Jesus embody the reign of God to be like? I hate to tell you this, but I've just encountered so many religious practitioners and leaders who can't speak about that, let alone demonstrate it. Well, it's like they've never read Luke 4 and they've never seen Jesus proclaiming the kingdom. They've never seen, he's saying, it looks like freedom. It looks like the end of oppression. It looks like the kingdom of God coming in power in these ways of restoration in the world around us. And so I'm doing a sermon series right now called the gospel according to Jesus. And we're just, we're walking through what is the kingdom and what does it look like and what does it mean? And it sounds like what you're saying is the question starts with what does the kingdom of God, what does good news sound like in this place? What what would it look like for people to experience a taste, a foretaste, a beginning of the kingdom of God now, so that they would ache for the fullness yeah. of the kingdom? The, because everything the Jesus does and life. says is about revealing the kingdom. Everything, like he's the birth yeah. narratives, are all about revealing his kingship. I mean, Luke yeah. four, as you mentioned, you know, he's uh, yeah. I presume you're talking about his uh, his kind of uh, speaking in the in the synagogue in yeah. Nazareth. Yeah. And, you know, the, the wilderness experience, his temptation experience, tells us what the kingdom of God is like. Um, his first sermon in, in uh, Nazareth, uh, uh, appropriating, as it were, Isaiah 61, like it, he tells us, I'm the fulfillment of all that Isaiah was hoping for. And then every miracle 
reveals something to us about the kingdom, that it's it, in the kingdom there is no sickness, there's no disease, there's no de demonic oppression, that there's enough food for everybody. Like every miracle isn't just an act of kindness, it's a, an indication that he is the king and it's a, it's a hint at an aspect of what his reign will look like. But then, of course, the Sermon on the Mount, all of the, all of the, the, the parables, then his death, which like evangelicals really focus on, his resurrection and his ascension, they all tell us like this is what the new world, this is what Isaiah's city of God is like. Jesus uses the word kingdom or reign of God, but this is the world that we're meant to be uh, participating in and which is unfolding all around us. And so, yeah, as you say, we need to ask ourselves, what does good news look like in a suburb in Idaho or in the Niger Delta? Or what does it look like in Sheffield or Sydney or Rio de Janeiro? Like it will look differently. I mean, we're not going to say, hey, let's go like you know, repropagate a forest in Boise, Idaho. It's like we're not going to steal that model and bring it into a context where it makes no sense. I know that's a ridiculous example, but that's often what we do. We think, oh, oh we see something right. happen over there, and then we go, right. oh, I'm Bobby is doing yeah. this thing in Idaho. That's like, let's buy that one off the shelf and like, let's let's do it right here without even considering whether I'll, that's. I'll sell you a training for how to how to start for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so I love that story about the Niger Delta. Um, one, I think the most stunning part of it is when he looked, there was already something God had put in place for right. that place. It was built into the created order and our like he he came in with a a different lens where he was asking what resource can i can i grab hold of that's already here and see it do what we're hoping to have happen that to me like when i think about what mission is the shape of water i almost want to think of it more like water soaks into the ground and fills the space that it it inhabits like like you put water into into a beach and it absorbs into a beach. Like it, it fills up that space because it's already like, it's becoming a part of that place rather than it's, you know, it's not covering a place. It's not wetting down a place. It's like soaking in and becoming a part of that place. So how, so when we send out missionaries to plant and we think differently about church planting, we, we don't want you to start a congregation. We want you to go live as a missionary and see the gospel bring to life the church in that place yeah. and so when when you're sending out missionaries and you say go go do this work of discovering what god's up to in a place how how do they how do they pay attention like what sort of curiosities do they need to bring to that work um yeah they need to do the, it, it's a it's a binocular um looking i mean they need to as we've just said i don't want to reiterate everything we just said but they need to be looking at the scriptures to figure out what does the reign of god look like because for a start i don't know that too many people are good good at it and uh, but then secondly they need to be looking at their culture and so what does the reign of god look like you mentioned some of those things it is about deliverance or salvation it is about kind of peace and reconciliation joy healing um an experience of the, the the near presence of god a kind of a new society a rebuilt society of redeemed persons um all of these things make up this kind of constellation of aspects of the reign of god so the more you study those things the more you then are looking at your context to ask well, what does peacemaking and reconciliation look like here? Is it necessary? I mean, is this a peaceful, reconciled community or neighbourhood? Is, is Do I join what's happening? Is there something happening? Where's What does joy look like? Is there a need for healing? What needs to be healed? Like you would be asking yourselves, in what ways would these aspects of the reign of God that, as I've said, the Old Testament anticipates and Jesus fulfills? I mean, there's so much material there for us to kind of build a, a, a kind of a, a scorecard, if you like, like, here's the slide rule, like, this is the reign of God, like, run it over a particular neighborhood. And what you discover is this neighborhood's actually intuited, or Christians in the past have made a contribution to this, that this neighborhood is really good on kind of uh, community or connection, or they're, they're really kind of uh, working really hard and doing really well on concern for the poor or something along those lines. I mean, that, that might be the case. It's like, join them, get behind it, back it, like it sounds great. 
but they don't know anything about this, or there's no need for that, or uh, there's no interest in in that aspect of the reign of God. Maybe that's where we start to need to kind of dig into the soil and to find those roots that are underground and to try to propagate something which is new and different. So, yeah, it takes uh, an enormous amount of um, inquisitiveness and uh, curiosity about the context that we're in. And just back on that guy, Tony Ronaldo, who went to Niger, um, the mission agency that sent him was not convinced that what he was doing was actually mission work. I mean, they continued to back him and support him, but his financial supporters back in Australia, people who were funding him to go preach the gospel, as they say, were like, wait a second, where is the preaching of the gospel happening? Like, he, he lost support and and has been viewed with some suspicion by the kind of the missions world, not because they think what he's done is bad, they think what he's done is great, but they're like, is this really missionary work? And that's mm-hmm. part of the problem, I think. A lot of our supporters, the churches that um, that we've, we've been sent out by, don't always get this kind of, this part of the process where before we're kind of proclaiming the gospel in any sense, we're actually doing the hard work of digging into the soil to find out where those, where the forest underground might be in order to kind of propagate something new. And that can take time. And so, yeah, yeah you need patience and you need patient supporters. Well, it's, it's funny because if you, if you talk to somebody and say, well, in Africa, in this part of the Niger Delta, there's this huge need and it will save people's lives and it will help them flourish. A lot of Christians would say, why would we care about that? Like crazy, like in their heads, they'd say, we are gospel people. We, we are people who preach. We tell people things. Yeah. Why, why does it, why doesn't UNESCO or some other aid organization who doesn't need the gospel go do that work? But you're saying that there is, and I, I would definitely agree with you that the gospel itself is an, is embedded into the work of helping humans yeah. flourish, right? Totally, yeah. I would say that um, my my shorthand definition of mission, I said to you before, mission is like water, it doesn't change. Well, what is mission? I think the mission of God's people is to alert everyone everywhere to the reign of God through both word and deed or announcement and demonstration. So you go to the Niger Delta and you say, I'm here to talk to you about the reign of God. Well, what's that? Here's what it looks like. It's about lifting thousands of families out of poverty because deliverance from oppression and poverty is part of the reign of God. Unexplained actions in and of themselves don't comprise the mission of God. Like you can't, you know, some people quote St. Francis of Assisi, who never actually said this, but they quote him saying, um, preach the gospel always and use words if necessary. Well, one of my great hero missiologists, David Bosch, replied to that and said, of course words are necessary. Unexplained actions in and of themselves don't constitute the mission of God's people. I mean, you can go and plant a forest, but if no one knows that you're doing that because you see this as an expression of the reign of God, then they'll be thankful for it, but it won't make any sense to them. Of course, it, it has to be explained in some sense. So if I'm going to go and uh, and, and expose atrocities in the Congo, or if I'm you know going to um, plant a, or start a, sorry, a, uh, the, the best coffee shop in town, um, at some point I need to be able to, it has to become clear to customers or to the locals, that in some way that what I'm doing is pointing to something even greater, not just freedom from from Belgian oppression in the here and now, but freedom of a new life, a new hope, a whole new way of being human. So, yeah, it's word and deed, most definitely. But sometimes the words will come later. Sometimes the words are an explanation of what people have just seen rather than the other way around. Yeah. Well, I, I could talk all day about this, um, but we're, we're going to run out of time soon. We will have to do a, a part two, I think, is, is the answer. We need, to, we need to talk about a lot of things. Uh, and I, what I really want to talk about next time is um, once, once we've identified what, what mission needs to look like in a place, how do we, what is that missional imagination? Like, how does it, how does it take us forward in from because a lot of us are coming from a a model in our minds and we're trying to make everything even if we don't try to make everything kind of look like the model eventually it's like yeah. we're 
were saying, oh, I'm going to do missions so that I can gather people and then preach to them and then have a worship service. You know, it's like we're, yeah, we're yeah. always trying to like move back into this traditional model. Um, what what does this sort of missional imagination look like once you've identified a need or a space where the kingdom could break in? How do you, how do you do the work of like figuring out what's next? Oh, well, I mean, what's next is either going to be join in with what's already happening and bring your expertise and vision and, and broader understanding of the reign of God into that context or launch whatever it is that needs to happen to respond to the particular need, whether it's to bring healing or peace or joy or justice. Um, I think we are sometimes too quick to say, yeah, I'm going to go plant a forest in, you know, the Niger, uh, rather than asking, wait a second, are there maybe not Niger like local Nigerians who are actually already at that work? How could I help support and fund and back them and get alongside them and be part of their team? I think, I mean, I think I've been saying this for years, we're very quick to want to launch and brand our own version of that. Like I referred before, like starting the best coffee shop in town, well, you're going to take business away from all the other coffee shops in town. So you want to think seriously about in what way am I kind of bringing blessing into the neighbourhood by starting some of the things I'm doing? So that's the next step, not only to recognise and understand, A, what does the kingdom of God look like? B, what would it look like here? What is good news to these people? Then C, do I need to launch something or do I need to partner with something that already exists? And the partnering with something that already exists actually gives you lots of great opportunities for missional engagement. There's already the veins that are running through the neighbourhood. So you're just kind of tapping into those and following those and building relationships with, with local people. So, yeah, to your point before about the Industrial Revolution and the the, the whole idea of kind of scale and uh and cost there's also a sense i think associated with that is too we like to have some uh, physical edifice that we have produced so even if it's not the sunday meeting with people in it it's like look i started that soup kitchen or look i started that program over there that runs stuff for kids or whatever it might be maybe that is what you need to do but i wouldn't jump straight to that in that process i would be asking you know in what way can I support what's already happening? Or if there's just no interest in social justice here, or there's just no interest in peacemaking and reconciliation, ha-ha, like now it, we need to determine what it might look like for us to launch something that helps to foster that. Yeah, I I love I love starting with asking what's already happening because it decenters us as the solution. Yeah, yeah. Ask how can we create other people and, and help help what other people are doing, make it into this beautiful thing that it could be and infuse the gospel into what's already happening. Like, I think that that's, that's a powerful way to think about it. And what I've found is that working on those things actually creates, we've got lots of people in my city who love the kingdom of God and don't know what's the kingdom of God, right, they're right, right. For the kingdom of God. And they're, they're trying to create the kingdom of God and they don't know the, the king. And it's yeah. like, I, I want to introduce the ones who who in Matthew 25 are saying, of course we do those things because that's what's what's good. They've been looking for the kingdom. And we wanna we wanna ask them, well, have you met the king? Have you have you found the hope of Jesus that that animates this center and then brings flourishing in the world? Because that's that's a powerful combo, right? Oh man, that is and I'm really glad you said that because I think that um I mean I should have said it. I'm glad you said it because um yeah, you'll get you get a lot of your neighbours cheering you on if you're there to kind of bring peace or justice or joy to the neighbourhood, absolutely, or to partner with those who are already doing it. Um, but, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. There are a lot of people today who are not, wouldn't identify as Christians, um, but who love the kingdom. That, as you say, they just don't know that that is the kingdom, but they don't want a king. They don't want to bend their knee. They don't want to, I mean, king... Kingliness is, uh, I know Americans don't have a king, so I don't know what your funny relationship with royalty and and uh, and the like. I'm my own king, man. Don't get in my way. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I mean, I live in Australia. We do have a king, the English king, and we don't even know what that means, to be quite frank. But I can't think of a better word than the word that's used in Scripture, which is king. I wish there was a better one. But whatever it is, is a person 
who you swear allegiance to, like you bend the knee to, you bow before, you you come under their authority. And, you know, it's a bit Game of Thrones, I suppose, isn't it? It's kind of like, you know, you are my liege. Like I I, I come under your authority. I, I bring my people and, and uh, we serve you. And in that sense, um, there are not too many people that want to think about doing that to anyone, uh, let alone Jesus. So, that's why I mean, we have emphasized stuff like um, advocacy and social justice and environmentalism, but I don't want it to be the case that we don't also talk about Jesus as the king, the one who actually, as you said, animates this, is at the center of this, because otherwise we just end up with another kind of utopian vision for how to make the world a better place. And I think we've tried everything from capitalism to communism to fascism to feminism to, you know, you name it, like every ism has been tried and failed. Like none of them have delivered on what they've promised to us. Like not one of them. I know Americans like capitalism, but it's not It's not perfect, guys. Like it's failing in so many ways in your country and, and in mine. And so we've tried every ism we can. It doesn't where well, we can't find our way out of the, this kind of shitstorm that we're in. So, so there's got to be some other way to do it. And, and the answer is, yes, Jesus does it. If we're willing to accept him as our king, it's actually this, the Holy Spirit that makes us different women and men who are able to transform the world and plant the seeds of readiness for the day in which Christ comes and consummates history and establishes his kingdom once and for all. You know, as, as you were talking about our, our complex relationship with kings and kingdoms, um, what what I'm thinking is maybe maybe we need to learn about the concept of a vassal kingdom from the ancient world, and, and it's still true today, where when we, when we pledge our allegiance, we bring with us all the things that have been entrusted to us under yeah. the kingdom well yeah, yeah, it's good. It, it allows us to reign and to have the authorities entrusted to us alongside of him and bring with the reign of god in our life that's what we see in the ancient world you see in acts uh these these households would would be transformed by a leader who's transformed i, I don't know I, you're sparking new things i gotta think about thank you thank you so much for joining me today frosty this is oh man i enjoyed it i enjoyed chatting to you yeah yeah and we will have to do it again so Mission is the Shape of Water by Michael Frost, available everywhere you get fine missional books, mostly <laughs> Amazon in the United mostly, States. Yeah, mostly. Mostly. yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to be giving Jeff Bezos some money, but um, yeah. yeah. Well, he had an expensive divorce, so somebody's got to pay for it. <laughs> um, well, thank you for being on. And remember, to all of our listeners, if you want to reach the people no one else is reaching, you've got to go where no one else is going and you got to become who no one else is becoming, which is the people of God in a new place, proclaiming the kingdom. Thanks for joining us, Frosty. Really appreciate hey, it. Hey, great to talk with you.